Hello and welcome to this three-part video series for the Foundry where I'm going to be looking at texturing an asset inside of Mari from a beginner's perspective, then as a more intermediate user, and then finally looking at how I would do it at work in a VFX studio. So my name is Michael Wilde. I'm a senior VFX artist currently working at ILM London. If you've ever Googled Mari tutorials, my stuff might have come up, which is why I'm here today for the Foundry, ready to teach new users to the software how to get texturing in it. So let's get started. Um, I'm inside of Mari 6 here. My face is gonna go away in a minute because it makes editing continuity an absolute nightmare. But I just wanted a little friendly face here as we get introduced. Uh, Mari is a difficult program. We can't cover everything in these videos. They're gonna be roughly about 10 minutes long. This first one might be a bit longer. Um, and we can't cover it all. That's the reality of it. But uh, there is a lot of information out there. If you do want a bit more in-depth knowledge on some of the things that we cover here, Obviously I will cover everything that I use going forward, but I can't tell you what every single button does. If you wanna know that, I've got a series I made myself, which is a really great introduction for the fundamentals of Mari, covers it all. The Foundry has some fantastic stuff on their YouTube and their website, and I recommend checking that out. And a lot of other users online have some really, really fantastic content. So yeah, I'm in Mari 6.0 here. I'm gonna make a new project first of all. So how do we do that? I just go file new, or I can click this new button here. Great, so it's gonna ask me for my geometry here and I just press this button here and I can load it up. So I've got my FBX file here. You can use OBJ, you can use ABC. Um, and if I click open that, because I'm using an FBX, it just has a few too many options. So I'm just gonna, I always ignore them. We've got this start frame down here, just so it doesn't think it's animated. I'm just gonna click single frame and we can ignore the rest as long as we've got our mesh in here. We've got some other tabs here. So I'm just gonna show you what these do, but we're not gonna actually use these, I'm gonna unclick everything. This just wants to make a default shader for me and some default channels. But because this is a video for beginners, I'm gonna do this all from scratch. So I'm gonna remove all that and I'll show you how to set that up yourselves. We've got this color setting tab here. Now color management is a whole video in itself. So we're not really gonna be going into that any more than needs be. But for example, if you were using ASUS CG, then you could select ASUS here. Or if you wanted to use a custom OCIO file, then you could do that here. If that doesn't make any sense to you, don't worry. And then finally lighting, Again, I'm gonna set up the lighting inside of the project, so we don't need to worry about this now, so I can show you how to do that later. Great, so I'm gonna press create new project and I'm gonna let it think for a minute. So we are gonna be using the node graph inside of Mari. We're not gonna be using layers. Now that might be a little bit scary for some of you if you're coming from other texturing packages like Substance or if you're familiar with Photoshop. However, I will say the node graph is one of the most powerful features in Mari and it just means you can work so much more efficiently and you can do just so many more powerful things and it's a lot less confusing because you just see everything laid out a lot nicer than you do with the layer system. Also, when you're making layers, actually what's going on underneath is it is just making all those nodes for you and it just becomes a bit of a spaghetti junction if you were to open the node graph of a project that you've been using layers with. So yeah, we're gonna pretend layers don't exist and just go straight in with nodes. And as you can see here, I've got the node graph open, but if you were to open Mari for the first time, then let me just default the settings to show you what that would look like. So this is what Mari looks like to begin with. So we've got our object here and I can just kind of rotate. I'm using Alt and clicking around and then middle mouse to kind of, and right click to zoom in, middle mouse to just pan a little bit. Um, if you don't like your settings to begin with, your navigation settings, you can go to edit preferences. And I think I've got mine set to, so you can go to navigation here. I've got mine set to Maya because that's what I'm coming from. But if you were familiar with one of these other packages, I think by default, it probably is Mari. Yeah, so I'm gonna just keep this as Maya and that's how I like to work. So what are we looking at? This is our viewport here. We've got, for example, an orthographic camera. I can change to the perspective camera if I wanted actual perspective rather than it being sort of a flat on sort of blueprint like you get with an orthographic camera. I've also got my UV, so I can just view the UVs as themselves here, or I can view it split with a camera, which is a really useful way to work um, sometimes, because sometimes you want to paint flat and sometimes you want to paint on the mesh. And then finally, I've just got my project window here if I'm working on lots of different assets at once. Um, we've got our different palettes here. There's a lot of them. We're not gonna touch on them unless I need them at the time. So we are gonna open up our node graph to begin with, which is at the bottom here, but I think it's hidden. So I'm just gonna click it and it should pop up. Great. And so you can see that Mari has made some nodes for me, but what I'm actually gonna do is just clear these out because we're gonna start from scratch. You might worry, oh no, I've just lost everything on my mesh. Don't worry, it's absolutely fine. We're gonna, we're gonna create this all ourselves. So how do we create a node inside of Mari? Well, you can press tab if you know the name of the node. For example, if I wanted a color, then I can click that and then just press enter and that will create that. Or what I can do is I can right click nodes and this will show me every single node that I'm working with here. So if I didn't know the name of it or if I just wanted to shop around a bit, you know, 
Then I could go through here. I'm also gonna make a shader. So I've got a color and I'm gonna make a shader. So I always use the principle BRDF, unless for example, you wanted to use like an Arnold or an Unreal one, but I think the principle BRDF is a really good standard to work with. So I'm gonna use this. So you can place this down, you can see actually nothing sort of change in our viewport. Now, why is that? In other texturing packages, if I made a new layer or something, it would show it straight away. Well, Murray's a little bit different. We're not viewing everything all the time because we're gonna have eventually quite complex node graphs and it's just gonna kill the program. And we don't wanna always see everything compiled together. We might just wanna look at one node singularly. So for example, this color node, if I double click this, it will show the node properties. This should be white, but I'm not seeing this on my mesh. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit one on the keyboard and that's gonna make this new viewer. And now you can see that it's showing this on the mesh. If I were to hit two on this node, then I can view that one as well. And if I click off that, I can hit one and two and so sort of jump between those. Um, so you can have up to nine using all the different keys of the keyboard. I actually personally only ever just use one. I just find it easier to kind of hop around. But if you wanted to be switching things, comparing things, then it's a really nice way to do that. So if we look at this color now, as you can see earlier, I've got my node properties on the right. So this is kind of how we change stuff in the nodes. So I'm just gonna make this red by clicking this color. It's gonna bring up a little UI for me and I'm just gonna make it bright red. Um, or you know what, actually let's let's just, let's mix it up a little bit. This is not my first take recording this and I've used red every time so far. So I'm gonna use blue for this one. And so if I want this to view on my shader, you might think, oh, I'm just gonna drag this into here. So we've got our outputs and our inputs and on these we can kind of drag and drop. While that is technically true, we're gonna actually just put a little node in between. So if you've ever worked with 3D stuff before, you might have heard the word channel before. So this is our shader here. And as texture artists, all we're doing is basically painting texture maps that inform the shader and we call those channels. So for example, we've got base color here, We've got specular, which tells you how bright or dark the specular color is. We've got roughness to tell you how rough or tight that specular is. And all we're doing is painting different maps to control these different things. And we, we add those all together. And at render time, that gives us hopefully some really awesome renders. The thing is, if I were to plug this color just straight into the base color, and we'll see now that updates. Um, this is great and all, but if I wanted to export this, I can't actually export this because Mari kind of needs a place for it to export from. And at the moment, we've just got this color, we've just got the shader and it doesn't export from the shader. So we need to make a thing called a channel. So I can do that and just drop down a channel node and you'll see it pops up this little UI here. So I have already named this earlier. So I'm just gonna call this base color again. You can type it in however you want. I'm gonna use just the same naming as the BRDF here. If you're working at a studio, you might have specific naming conventions, but yeah, I'm gonna use base color as my name there. I'm going to make the size 4K, that's fine with me. If I wanted to change the bit depth of the image, say for example, you're working with a 32 bit float for a displacement, if that's going over your head a bit, don't worry. Um, you could change that here, but I'm gonna use 8 bit, 8 bit is fine. I never change file space, I've never needed to change file space, so just ignore that one. And this color node, we don't have to worry about because we're gonna be inputting our own color. If this were a paint node, for example, which uses the same UI, then this would be important. So we're, we're gonna talk about that more a little bit later on. And these color data options, again, it's using the automatic one here. This is fine for now. I don't wanna to talk too much about color management, but we are gonna to have to at some point. But for this color channel, this is absolutely fine. So we're just gonna use the default and I'm gonna click okay on that. You'll see now it drops down this channel and I'm gonna actually put my color into there by dragging and dropping it. I'm gonna unplug this by dragging that off and then I'm gonna put that into the base color. And now we've got this channel here and you can see if I open my channel palette, which by default is one of the, the palettes that is open, you can see I've got this channel here and if I wanted to change any of the settings, I could, for example, uh, resize it to 2K, stuff like that. So now we've got this channel and this is now also exportable. So I can right click and export this channel later on if I wanted to. So that's how we get our texture data out of Mari. So I'm gonna do exactly the same thing because I also wanna set up my specular roughness. So I'm gonna view the shader again. And let's just have a look at that. And you can see, yeah, the specular on this, if I zoom in, it's just looking a little bit flat. So I wanna change the specular roughness to make it a bit more shiny as if it was some sort of shiny plastic. So I'm just gonna shift and go channel, um, create that again. Uh, this time I'm gonna call this specular roughness. Oh, actually, sorry, I'm gonna use the same conventions before I use a underscore. Um, I'm gonna make this, 8-bit is fine for this. Again, we're gonna leave this as is. So now we have to look at this color data option because we're working with specular roughness. We do need to change something here. And I do need to briefly explain 
a bit of a fundamental term when it comes to texturing. We've got two types of data really inside of Mari. We've got color data and we've got scalar data. So color data is something that is seen on the mesh. For example, this blue object, the blue color is piped in and I'm seeing it directly on the mesh. Whereas things like, for example, specular roughness, which is a black and white map, which defines how shiny or rough something is, isn't ever actually seen on the mesh. You never see that black and white. Like we're not gonna see that physically represented on the mesh at render time. However, the information that we pump in to the shader through that map does calculate things. So it's kind of whether it's seen or whether it's calculated. Now, specular roughness is calculated, it's not physically seen. So we need to tell Mari that this is scalar data because if it's calculated, it's scalar. If it's seen, it's color data. It is a bit of a confusing term, but as you start to texture more, you will become more comfortable with it. Yeah, and so specular roughness is a scalar channel, so we just need to make sure that that's turned on. So now I can plug this in. If we view our shader again, I've got this new channel now, and I can plug this into our roughness. And nothing's changed, obviously, because we've got no input into this. But before we do that, I'm just going to change the lighting so that we can sort of see this working on our mesh a little bit better. So when we created the project earlier, it did have this lighting option. I'm just going to pull this off and I'm going to click this pin button just so it doesn't disappear. It stays there permanently. So Mari, we've kind of got these four lights that we can turn off and on. But we can also add an HDRI, which it calls an environment here, um, if I wanted to. And I'm just going to do that just to get some specular highlights a little bit nicer. So we've got some options here. I'm going to leave everything as it is, but there are some default HDRIs. You could import your own one, but I'm just going to click on this and it'll just give me some of them. So let's go with this, this studio lighting setup here. It's quite nice. I'm going to click OK on that. And now you might be like, why is it not showing it to me? Well, because we need to turn it on. So you just need to click this button here. And so it is a little bit bright, actually, this one. Um, let me just check. Uh, what about this one? That's a little bit better. So actually, we're going to go this one. And if you found this a little bit distracting, then you could also blur this. So if I just scroll down here, I can blur this a little bit. Um, so it's slightly less distracting. So I'm just going to leave it like that for now. Um, yeah, so we've got a little bit more light to play with because specular is so reliant on the light that it's responding with. So what we're going to do here for our specular, because specular, like we said earlier, is a black and white map, doesn't have any color in it, the specular roughness. So I'm actually going to make a constant node here. And this is just going to give me a pure value. And I'm going to drop that into my input here. And so with specular roughness, one is incredibly rough. Zero is incredibly tight specular, like as if it's a chrome ball. So I'm just going to scroll that down. You can slightly see that changing here now. And um, so depends on the kind of material you're going with. We're going to talk about that more later on. But I'm just going to do something a little bit tighter just so that it doesn't, this felt really, really washed out and almost like velvet. So we're just going to do it something like that so it responds to our specular a little bit nicer. So now really what we've started doing here is we've actually started texturing. I mean, it's it's an incredibly basic setup, but we've got some color. And so if I view my specular roughness, I can just press one on this to view it, not the shader, just the pure flat map. And we can see that this is the value of the spec roughness with it set to 0 0.194. And the same with my base color, if I were to view that. So these are my maps that I would export if I were to right click export this then I could get this out and I could start rendering with this. Obviously, incredibly basic textures, but if it's your first day in Mari, you're actually able to get textures out quite quickly. So we're going to add just, we're going to spice it up ever so slightly. We're going to add one slight detail. We're going to add a little bit of color breakup, um, and then we're going to call it a day there. So what we're going to do is in our base color, we're actually going to add a pop of red. Let's do that. I want to make one of the arms red. How do I do that? Well, so what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to use another fundamental node inside of Mari. I'm just going to view the principal BRDF here. Uh, and that's a merge node. So if we press M, and this is kind of how you add things on top of each other, how you layer them on top of each other. So I'm going to merge my red over my blue. And what I can do as well to keep it a bit more housekeeping, on a node, you can rename them here if I just go up to the top here. So I'm just going to call this blue, and I'm going to make a new color node, or I could copy and paste this node by just dragging it, pressing Control C, Control V. And I could do that if I wanted to. Or I could make a new one by just going color, um, by pressing Tab. Um, and I'm going to call this one red and hit enter on that. And then I'm just going to make this red. I'm going to make it a bit of a, a bit of a burgundy. Why not mix up a bit? And I'm going to basically inside of our merge node, you can see we have our base layer, then we have our overlayer. So the overlayer, if you think about it as if you're putting something on top of something, the over goes on top. And we're going to put that over this and you'll see what's going to happen is it's going to flood it with the burgundy. Um, and that's because I'm telling it to go everywhere. So we've got this third slot here, which is a mask. And this basically just allows me to add in a black and white input, which tells it where it's black, use the base, and where it's white, use the over. And if there's a gray, then mix it.
So what we're going to do, like I said, I wanted to make one of the arms red. So we're going to use our kind of final fundamental node, which is the paint node. So I'm going to press tab and type in paint, or I can also press P, I think, on the keyboard. Um, and that's going to create a paint node. And we've got a very, very similar look to earlier when we were creating our channel, only we don't have to name it because the channels need naming and these don't. So again, I'm going to use 4K, 8-bit is fine. So we've got this color option here. And so this wasn't important with the channels, but with paint nodes it is because basically this is what it's going to flood the paint node with to begin with, our kind of base level. And obviously we can change that, but sometimes it's really nice just to sort of have everything set up for me. So a mask is a black and a white map to tell you where something is and something isn't. So I'm going to use black as my default. You just need to keep an eye out. If you ever see this, it means there's an alpha. So just set your alpha to one and then I'm going to keep it a black. If I wanted to have it a white, I could do that. And I could also like set it to a color if I weren't using this for a mask, but black is fine for this. And again, talking about scalar and color data earlier, so masks are never seen on the mesh. They just affect things. They just calculate for us. So they are scalar data. Um, so we're going to make sure that this is ticked and we're going to click OK on that. And now what's going to happen is when I drop this black into it, the red is going to completely disappear. And that's because, as I explained, a mask is a black and a white image where when you have white, it exposes the over channel. When you have black, it just shows the base that you originally had piped in. So the red being the over isn't showing because we have a fully black map here. So what we need to do is we need to add white where we want this red to be exposed. So we're not actually gonna paint anything into this paint node yet. We'll talk about that more later on in one of the other videos. What I am gonna do just to wrap this video up is I'm gonna select a part of the mesh using the selection tool on the top left there. And I'm going to fill that area with white in the paint node so that we get just a red arm. So inside of Mari, we've actually got three different types of selection. So we can select the entire object. If we go onto our left here, we've got our selection mode. We can select our entire object, our patch. So patches are what Mari calls UDIMs. So if we go back to our UVs here, you can see I've got three UDIMs. So this, these are three different patches. Or I can select faces. So I want to select faces because I just want to select this right arm. So if I were to scroll in here, you can see I've got the marquee settings up here. So on your tools, so if, if I were to switch to the paintbrush, you can see you've got settings for your current tool selected here. So I've got the selection tool. And if I were to do that, then it's going to select a few faces for me. That's great. Um, but I actually want to select the entire arm. So um, I'm going to turn on my wireframe just to show this a little bit better over the, the blue. So I want to select all of these. I want to select everything that's kind of connected. So Mari's actually, we've got our lasso, so I could do this, but it's just a little bit irksome and you can see it doesn't select the things around the back. But I've actually got this smart selection mode, which is really, really fantastic. It's one of my favorite features of Mari. If I collect, select this instead, and now you can see we've got connected mesh, connected UVs, and we've got a few others. So I'm actually gonna use smart selection with connected mesh. If I were to drag, um, it's gonna, every bit that I select is gonna look and see what mesh is actually physically like merged with that, and then it's going to select that all for me. So now I've got this entire arm. You can see I've missed one here, so I'm just going to shift and click on that to select that as well. Are there any other bits? I'm just going to, I think that that's missing there. Great. Just make sure I've got everything. I'm just going to shift, add it. Um, great. And now I've got that entire arm selected. And what I can do with this paint node selected, I can right click and go fill, and I'm going to fill this with white. And it's going to fill the current selected paint node with white or whatever I tell it to fill it with. It's going to think about it for a second and now you can see that entire selection is filled inside of my mask with white and I can view that here. I can just view the mask node and this mask is basically saying in the black area of this merge node use the base which is blue and where it's white add this over thing on top and make it red. So it might look super basic and not great but we've covered all the kind of fundamentals that we're going to be sort of building upon here. And we also have textures that are ready to export if, if we wanted. And that's pretty good for first day inside of Mari. So I know I've thrown a lot at you here. In the second video, we're going to start adding a little bit more variation, kind of talking a bit more in depth about some of the things we've talked about. But yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we hit all of the sort of base fundamentals. And also you've got textures that are ready to go. If you, if you wanted to render these, you could right click, export, export that current channel, and then tell it on your system where to go. And yeah, you've got textures. So join me in part two, and we're going to look at a slightly more intermediate look at texturing inside of Mari, taking these textures to the next level. And then in the third part, we're going to look at how I do it as a VFX artist on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for sticking with me. I've been Mike Wild. Take it easy.